So with that, I will move directly to introduce our first speaker, uh, Joa Hannah Hannock is Associate Professor of Classics at Brown University. Her new book, The Classical Debt, Greek Antiquity in an Era of Austerity, Harvard University Press, explores how Western fantasies of classical antiquity have created a particularly fraught relationship between the European West and the country of Greece, especially in the context of Greece's recent tale of two crises. She is also the author of Lycurgan Athens and the Making of Classical Tragedy and co-editor with Richard Fletcher of uh, the volume Creative Lives in Classical Antiquity, Poets, Artists, and Biography. She is active in Brown's program in Modern Greek Studies and sits on the board of the Modern Greek Studies Association. She also serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Modern Greek Studies and Adelon. Johanna? Sorry. Okay. Wait for start. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan, and thank you very much to the program committee for putting this together. I think it was a great idea, and I'm really honored to be on this panel um, with such wonderful fellow panelists. Um, I have to admit, I thought that the, the sort of screen to room ratio would be a little bit different than it is. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I do have some quotations, but I'll be re there'll be nothing on the screens so that won't be in, in my paper. So, um, on the morning of Wednesday, November 29th, the President of the United States retweeted three videos that allegedly depicted Muslims committing acts of violence against Christians in Europe. Notoriously, those videos had first been posted by Britain's Jada Franzen, deputy leader of the extreme right ultranationalist party Britain First. But what is of interest to me here is not so much the president's decision to tweet them. Instead, what I want to consider is how White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders justified the whole affair. So later that same morning, Sanders told reporters who had questioned the video's authenticity, she said, whether it is a real video, the threat is real. That is what the president is talking about. That is what the president is focused on, is dealing with those real thre threats. And those are real no matter how you look at it. Over on CNN.com, this is how CNN editor Chris Salitza translated Sanders's flim flam. The end justifies the means. We know that Muslims commit acts of violence and hate the West. So whether or not the actions depicted in these videos are real doesn't actually matter. They are a symbol of something that is real. So he was, he was parsing Sarah Sanders' words. I just wanted to keep Chris Salitza's good name. That is not what he is saying, but that was his interpretation of Sarah Sanders. So what Sanders avowed then was not the truth of, their, of these videos, but rather their truthiness. A term coined by Stephen Colbert on the Colbert Report in an episode that aired on October 17, 2005. The Oxford Dictionary now defines truthiness as, quote, the quality of seeming or being felt to be true, even if not necessarily true, end quote. And this word was also the ever saucy Merriam-Webster's 2006 word of the year. I don't know if people follow Merriam-Webster on Twitter, but it's worth it. <laughs> so the current presidential administration has, to say the least, a difficult, complicated, and uncomfortable relationship with the truth. And of course, it's not. Oh, I have another one. And then, of course, it's not only present truths that present challenges for these politicians and their staff. Again and again, we've seen certain established facts of history dissolve in their hands. These moments tend to be dismissed as further proof that Trump knows nothing about history, and that is certainly the case. But I'd argue that there is a difference, if not in cause, then in effect and significance between the kinds of historical errors he makes. Simple, even willful ignorance might be to blame for his thinking that Korea used to be part of China, or that Frederick Douglass is still alive, 
or that, quote, there is no reason there is not peace between Israel and the Palestinians, none whatsoever, end quote. Yet something bigger is at stake, I think, in his insistence, in his detailed insistence, that Andrew Jackson, whom Trump deeply admires, and who died in 1845, was, quote, really angry when he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War, end quote. <laughs> and that something is still more manifest in a commemorative plaque located between the 14th and 15th holes at the Trump National Golf Club in Potomac, Virginia. The Battle of Balls Bluff took place 12 miles up the river in October of 1861, but nothing of great historical moment actually happened at the site of Trump's golf course, nor did the river there ever run red with blood. Trump's view of history in these particular instances seems to fit a mold described by American historian Jill Lepore in her work on the Tea Party political movement whose obsession with the American founding fathers famously crossed over into religious reverence. In her 2010 book, The Whites of Their Eyes, The Tea Party's Revolution and the Battle Over American History, Lepore described the American far right's historical praxis as anti-history. In anti-history, she explains, time is an illusion. Either we're there 200 years ago or they're here among us. End quote. The approach he observed was more literal than an analogy. It wasn't our struggle is like theirs, it was we are there or they are here. Anti-history, Lepore charges, quote, has no patience for ambiguity, self-doubt, and introspection. It is broadly anti-intellectual and quite specifically anti-historical, not least because it defies chronology, the logic of time, end quote. If this kind of vernacular American history defies the logic of time, if they're all here and we're all there, then why shouldn't Andrew Jackson have been appalled at the Civil War? And if anti-history can so easily flout chronology, why shouldn't it resist geography too? In 2015, when New York Times reporter Nicholas Fandos asked Trump to comment on historians' insistence that no battle had ever been fought at the site of his golf course, Trump retorted, quote, how would they know that? Were they there? <laughs> he then told Fandos, quote, you don't have to talk to anybody. It doesn't make any difference. But many people were shot. It makes sense. In the course of that interview, Trump also told Fandos that he was a big history fan. For the rest of my short time, I want to use American anti-history as a prompt to think again about history could be constructed, not by historians, but by orators, politicians, and the public in classical Athens. I want, in other words, to reconsider briefly the logic of Athenian vernacular history. An example actually very close to the American they're here and we're there motif occurs at the very end of Eschines' speech against Ctesiphon, his prosecution speech in Demosthenes' famous crown trial of 330 BCE. In that speech, Eschines urges the jurors, once Demosthenes has made his rebuttal, to imagine you see upon the bema where I stand and from which I now address you, marshaled in hostile array against these men's violence toward the state, Solon, who outfitted democracy with the finest laws, a wise man and just lawgiver, begging sensibly, as he would do, that you in no way prize Demosthenes' words above oaths and laws. Eschines then goes on to invite the jurors also to imagine Aristides, who established the tribute system of the Arche inveighing bitterly against this mockery of justice. Then, with the flourish of a last rhetorical question, he finally drops the mic. Don't you think that Themistocles and the men who died at Marathon in Plataea and even the very tombs of the ancestors will cry aloud if someone who colluded with barbarians against Greeks is to be crowned? In the whites of their eyes, Lepore notes that in the United States, the founding fathers only started to roll over in their graves, at least according to political rhetoric about a century ago. You might remember that during the Obama administration, though, they allegedly tossed and turned quite a bit. But the idea that a state's moldering ancestors might get feisty over the current state of the state they founded is, it turns out, millennia older than the likes of Sarah Palin. Eschines' words might seem like low-hanging fruit from my argument, but there is much further evidence that other Athenians, too, had a habit of both flattening and fudging their city's history, and of collapsing time. 
The Athenian funeral orations, the Epitaphioi Logoi, are well known for their tendency to, in the famous words of Nicole Leroux, assimilate the city to an unchanging temporality. The whole convention of the city's ubiquitous epitaphic discourse demanded that Athens, be, Athens and Athenians be imagined as unchanging, uh, a marvelous transhistorical constant. And sometimes that marvelousness demanded a certain elasticity from the history upon which it was constructed. It demanded, in other words, alternative facts. A great many texts in praise of Athens, from Isocrates' Panegyricus of the 380s to Demosthenes' 330 Epitaphios for the Fallen of Chironea, claim, for example, that the Athenians were alone, monoi, fighting the Persians at Marathon. Herodotus, too, records that claim in a speech supposedly made by an Athenian before the Battle of Plataea. And yet three books earlier, in Book 6, Herodotus had described in propria persona how the, how the Plataeans themselves, quote, came to help at Marathon. And so uh, I just put a point of bibliography for more on this and related points. There's a great article by K.R. Walters, uh, We Fought Alone at Marathon, Historical Falsification in the Attic Funeral Oration. At the beginning of his history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides makes a complaint against his fellow Greeks that I'm sure many Americans would be quick to lodge against their own compatriots today. After bemoaning how, quote, the majority of Athenians believe, that is incorrectly, that Hipparchus was killed by Harmodius and Aristogeiton when he was tyrant, Thucydides makes this broader observation about the epidemic of historical ignorance. The other Hellenes, too, hold many other such misconceptions, even about present matters not forgotten with time. So little is the public concerned with seeking the truth and thus does it fall back on the readiest accounts. And yet, had the Athenian speechwriters been charged with falsifying history in the point of, say, Marathon, they might well have responded with a defense essentially similar to Sarah Sanders' justification of Trump's notorious retweet. Whether it is a real detail, the broader idea is real. The Athenians were the only Greeks responsible for defeating the Persians at Marathon, and that is real no matter how you look at it the claim passes the truthiness test. Or, as Trump put it, when pressed on the historicity of the river of blood, it doesn't make any difference. The purpose of this short paper, however, has not been to deliver an op-ed in the tired tradition of suggesting that there is nothing new under the sun. Instead, the point that I'm aiming to raise is that while American and Athenian anti-history and indeed invented history certainly have their differences, they also share enough to warrant our pause especially when we consider how easy it is to ridicule the one and romanticize the other, to dismiss the one as anti-intellectual and characterize the other as elegant and masterful, further proof of the ancient Greek miracle. After all, the president's mistakes and gaffes are subtended by officials and voters who are perfectly willing to incorporate them into this country's historical narratives. And the long idealized Athens still calls out for an even healthier dose of modern skepticism in the face of its own brand of remarkably effective and sometimes anti-historical nationalism and propaganda. Thank you.